，你好，我是山城，凤凰工作是程序员。Hello, I am the Rising Phoenix Studios developer. My name is Jessica. C Sharp happens to be my favorite programming language、uh, out of the entire list of languages out there currently. Although、uh, that's not to say that C Sharp doesn't have its difficulties or its flaws. It indeed does. Now, I want to point out that C Sharp is a multi-paradigm. Object-oriented first programming language developed by Microsoft. For many years, the language was only available on Microsoft Windows. Recently, with the advent of Xamarin, Unity 3D, Mono Develop, Mono,、uh, .NET Core, C# Sharp is now cross-platform on all the major operating systems. Now, to begin、uh, learning C# Sharp, the very first thing you need is obviously、uh, the IDE or Integrated Development Environment. I would highly suggest downloading Visual Studio.、Uh, the current version is Visual Studio 2017.、Uh, you can also get Visual Studio Code, which will also allow you to write in C Sharp, and it is multi-platform. Another option is Mono Develop and Sharp Develop. Now, Visual Studio is for Windows only. So, if you don't have a Windows machine, use one of the other options I suggested. Now, the first thing any programmer does when they start to learn a programming language is to write a Hello World program. Now, the reason for this is just to make sure that the compiler is working and everything along those lines. It's not so much as a learning exercise as it's basically the simplest program you can ever write. So without further ado, let's go ahead and take a look at what a Hello World program looks like. A Hello World program in C Sharp is very similar to、uh, Java.、Uh, the syntaxes for both languages are very similar, but if you are completely new to programming, as I designed this to be for, then you wouldn't care. You're like, okay, what is this? So, first off, using system.、Uh, this is a namespace. This allows us to access the console、uh, class, which basically says, "Hey, print this to the screen." Now you see something called namespace. This is something that works with inheritance and also with、uh, creating classes and general.、Uh, Object-oriented programming designs, and we'll go get into that more later. So you have a public class, hello. Now this class is basically、uh, just a sample.、Uh, normally it would say whatever the name of the、uh, program is for the class, or that specific script, I should say. Again, we'll get into classes later. Next, you have static void main string args. Again, we will get into that later. <laughs> console dot write line. This is basically saying, okay, I want you to write this line to the console. And what do we want to write? Hello world. Once we compile and run it, we will see hello world printed in the console window, and we'll actually see a、uh, live demo of this later. Again, just kind of to reiterate, let's break it down a little bit further. So, using system, the using statement imports a namespace into a class that you're working with.、Uh, for example, you have the system namespace.、Uh, if you're working in Unity 3D, you have mono behavior,、uh, things of that nature. The using statement allows the usage of a class that's that resides in another namespace. There are more things this can do, but this is the basis of what it does. Namespace. This organizes code in a very specific way.、Uh, it can be organized based off of、uh, what the entire structure of that namespace is supposed to handle, such as, for the example, system. Well, it handles a whole bunch of system tasks, but one of the 
things you can access is the console class, so you can write things to the screen. Next up, we have the class. Think of class like a blueprint. It basically spells out everything that needs to be done. Without the system using statement, we would not be able to do console.writeLine hello world. Yes and no for this. Uh, you could explicitly cast it, but again, uh, that's a little more advanced. I'm trying to keep this as simple as possible. So, console.writeLine is a method that takes the string input. In other words, uh, it takes uh, letters, numbers, alphanumeric uh, characters, uh, special characters, and puts them like they are a word. All strings are encased in quotations. Don't worry, we'll go into more depth on what methods are later. For now, just know what some methods do that some methods do not require anything while others require something. Now, primitive word types. I know it sounds very, very uh, daunting, but basically what primitive word types are basically your strings and caret values or char values. They're basically the building blocks of words and phrases. They can contain both numbers and letters, but here's an example of string uh, I named it hello. Uh, in quotations, you have the hello word and a semicolon, which terminates the line, which means it's done. Next, we have char x, or care x, depending on how you want to pronounce it. Now, you will notice that it's in single quotes. Or is that the other one? I forget the name of it. But you see that there is a forward slash with the x0058. This is because char values actually use the Unicode uh, interpretations, which means if you were to say char x equals x, and then you would want to return that, it would actually give you the uh, Unicode value for it, and vice versa. In this example, uh, since we have the Unicode there, it would actually print the uh, X value. Next, we have primitive true-false types, which are called Booleans. Basically, if something is true or false. By default, whenever you create a Boolean, it's going to be false. So in the example, bool is true equals false with the terminating semicolon. Now. Let's say I did not put false there, and I just put a semicolon right after is true. Now the compiler would complain, but let's not go into that right now. It would automatically default to false when you compile it. Mind you, I have definitely oversimplified th these explanations, but the actual verbiage in the documentation is much more verbose, verbose and was a major source of headaches for me as a beginner due to the verbosity of it. So moving on, we have some basic mathematical operators. We have the plus sign, which is used for both addition and concatenation. Now we'll go into what concatenation is later. So just think of it as addition right now. Next we have the minus sign, which is used for subtraction. We have the backslash, which is used for division as well as other things but just think of it for mathematics now. And of course we have the modulus sign. Now, the modulus sign is division where you actually have the remainder playing a crucial role and it's very useful. Next up, we have the plus equal sign. So yes, we do have equals. Now I want to point something out. The equal sign uh, does not mean it is equal to something. What it actually means is that you're setting it to be something else. For example, let's say we have, oh, let's go back up to string hello. You see how we have the equal sign there. Well, we're setting the string hello to mean the value hello in the parentheses, if that makes any sense. It gets a little, 
it takes a little bit to get used to, but trust me, it it's worth it. Next, we have plus equals, which is a shorthand way of doing x is set to x plus y. Or in this case, it would actually y would be one, x plus one. Uh, minus equals is a shorthand way of doing x is equal to x minus one. Or in this case, y as my example. I don't know why I put the y. I was thinking mathematically. Uh, times equal a shorthand way of doing x is set to x times y or x times one. And also, I do also want to say that plus equals doesn't always have to be plus one. It could also be by itself. Same thing with any of these other ones. Uh, division equals uh, x is set to x divided by y or one or itself, depending on how it's all set up. And then modulus equals, a shorthand way of doing x is set to x modulus y, x modulus one, whatever you want to do. Alright, got it? I hope so. Good. So now, in this slide, I'm actually doing a real-world example here. Uh, integer a. Uh, basically, a number a is equal to 3. Integer b, a number b, equals 0. And then, I say b is set to a plus a, which means b is no longer set to 0. That is gone, out of the water. No longer exists. Remember that. It is now... 3 plus 3. Same thing with B is set to 3 minus 3. Even though it does become 0, that's besides the point. Uh, B is set to 3 times 3. So in this case, it would be 9. Uh, B is set to 3 divided by 3, which is 1. And B is equal to 3 modulus 3, which is also 1. We can also do do b plus equals a. So whatever the value of b was, we're going to add a to it. In this case, it would be 3. b minus equals a. So the original value was 0. So that would be negative 3. b times equals a, or times set, uh, is 3. No, 0. Sorry. Wow. Mathematics! It's hard. B divided by equals A. Uh, again, 0. And B modulus equals A. I believe that is also 0, or it could be 3. I don't remember the mathematics on that one. But in any case, these are examples. Alright, now that we have that down... We need to learn how to write a method so we can test this. So in C Sharp, it has a main method. So let's focus on that one first and foremost. The main method is where your program begins, which most programmers would call, or I shouldn't say most, all programmers will call the entry point. Nothing will run without this method, and if this method does not call any other method, nothing will run. Or I should say, if the method does not call any other method or have any uh, functions within the method itself. Nothing will happen. So static void main string args empty. Let's talk about the string args. String args and in this case string is an array. We'll get into arrays a little bit later on. Args is a par parameter but parameters are not going to be discussed right now. So let's actually change the main method uh, to be without the parameters. And this is actually still a valid c -sharp program. Static void main. Empty. Wing bam, thank you ma'am. Or is it wham bam, thank you ma'am. And it's much easier easier to use for a beginner. So now that we have learned from the so now that we have learned the primitive types, 
let's actually take what we've learned and apply it, as well as create some methods later on. Alright, so let's take a look here. Static void main, and in this example I did include the string args, but you can actually remove that and it would still run just fine. Int a equals 1, so it's a number that equals 1. Int b equals 0, or is set to 0. String hello is hello with a space. b equals a plus a. Then we're going to use the console to write b. Then we're going to also use the console to write a line for hello plus the number a. And in this case, it would actually be string concatenation. Because what actually happens is instead of it uh, trying to do addition with these, it's actually just going to add the one to the uh, hello. And the last thing is console.readline. What this does is it makes it so that the program will not just automatically close once it finishes running. So it kind of leaves it up for us to be able to look at and go, oh, that's what happens. So again, I do reiterate this in the slide, so pay close attention to line 10. No code would be complete without commenting. That tells us important information about hard to read code or code in general. So let's take a look at that. So commenting can be done in three separate ways and they all have a very specific purpose. Doing two forward slashes creates a standard comment. This is something if you want to talk about a specific line of code. Say maybe you've written some very intricate math and you want to explain it a little bit for someone. That's what that would be there for. Multi-line comment, which is the forward slash with the uh, star symbol, which is shift 8. And then at the end, shift 8, then the forward slash, or backslash, slash. <clears throat> A multi-line comment, this is useful, say, if you want a more structured way of talking about say a method or something that you're working on and you don't want to keep doing the two slashes at the beginning before writing a sentence. This allows you to have multiple lines. This also allows you to say you have a long function and you have a giant bug in the program and you can't figure it out. This will allow you to just put in that multi-line comment and comment out all of that code without having to do the slashes for each line. And finally, three slashes creates what's called XML documentation. This is used when you want to describe what the method does to someone that will be using the method. So if you're writing, say, a library, or you're exposing public methods for people to access later on, then the XML documentation would basically say give an explanation of what the code does and how to use it. Let's move on to conditionals and these are actually my favorites and I use them very often. So let's start off with the if else if else. Now for a myriad of languages this could be different but in C sharp, this is how it's set. If is mandatory. Else if and else are optional. And else is implied. So if something happens, or uh, let me actually uh, put it more into a programming term instead of uh, uh, it's the scientific method way. So if something happens then you then this is supposed to happen which is inside that if block but it's going to automatically assume else if this is not the case do nothing or do something else or do the reverse of it 
Typically it's do nothing though. There are also some additional operators that coincide with the mathematics operators that work wonderfully with conditionals. So you have the greater than, the less than, the greater than or equal to, the less than or equal to, and the equality signs. Let's take a deeper look into these. Again, let's go with a uh, real code example here. Static void main. Int a equals 1. Int b equals 0. If a is greater than b, write hello to the console. Else if a is equal to b, then write to the console something new. Else write to the console Bieber. In this case, uh, of course, if would, it would write hello. Play around with different operators and see what happens. The results are a certain way. Uh, in other words, just write some random uh, code uh, using less than, greater than, less than or equal to, greater than or equal to, along with the if statements and just see if what you think will happen is what happens because conditional statements are an extremely powerful tool and the next section is looping 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 loops there are four main types of loops in C-sharp we have the for loop the for each loop the while loop and the do while loop so let's take a quick look at a real example here. Uh, for int i equals 0, i is less than 10, i plus plus. Now the plus plus operator, that means that it will add 1. And then I'll write to the console i. And then we have console.readline so that way we can see what's going on. So, it is important to note that the starting point of i is always going to be at 0. For the most part, whenever you're looping, it's going to be at 0. The ending point, in this case, is actually going to be after 10, but not quite 11. So, in this case, uh, i starts at 0 ends at a little bit past 10 to be honest so pay attention to the results when you run the program the reason this happens is because once i is equal to 10 it will exit the loop so the loop will run one more time after it reaches 10 but it won't write anything to the console so it's actually 11 times the loop will run something to keep in mind now the for each loop is actually one of my uh, more favorite loops to use. But the general syntax for it is for each, then you can do the var keyword, or you can do int whatever it is that you're working with. I typically use var. num in i, and then I want to cast it to string, so I put dot to string, and then I write to the console num. So the for each loop in this example is actually a bit more complex because it's using both the for loop and a for each loop. And it's also typically frowned upon to do so. Uh, the reason being is, well, it's not efficient whatsoever. So to make it as simple as possible, I put it inside of a for loop. You saw them. A moment ago, toString will convert the object to a string type. Notice I removed the i from the console write line and put num instead. The results are the same as the original for loop, but this is, like I said, a much more complex version of the for each loop. However, once you learn another data type, we will look at the for each loop again with the much more simplified concept. Next, we have the do while loop. In this example, uh, do a plus equals a plus one and then console that right line a after that while 
A is less than 100. And then we close that. And then we have a console read line. So the do while loop should be super simple to understand, although a bit more daunting to look at. It's basically do this job while this condition is true. In this case, do the addition of a plus a is equal to a plus 1. So it's going to count in odd number increments and write it to the console window while a is less than 100. These results may astound you, so let me explain what is happening. a plus equals a plus 1 is the expression. Remember, with each run of the loop, a gets bigger. So it starts off with a is 0. So a plus equals 0 plus 1. So it equals 1. Then it becomes 1 plus equals 1 plus 1, which is 3. 3 plus equals 3 plus 1, which is 7. And so on and so forth until it reaches 127. And because 127 is bigger than the 100, the exit condition will have been met. Pretty cool, right? Next up, we have the while loop. And much simpler than much more simple than the uh, do while loop. So let's take a look here. Int a equals zero. While a is less than 100, a plus equals one. Console.write line a. So the while loop is pretty simple to understand. While the condition is true, while the condition has not been met, do this job. In this case, while a is less than 100, add 1 to a and write it to the console window. Simple, straightforward. I should also note that it also locks up other processes while it's in a while loop, so be careful about that. I did say things would get harder, didn't I? Well, probably not. So next up, we have the switch statement. A switch statement allows you to execute from a list of candidates. So let's take a look here. In this example, I implemented the random class, which again is in the system namespace. So random rand equals new random. So random is a pseudo random number, which means it's not true random. In computing, there is no such thing as true random. You can emulate as close to it as possible, but it's never going to be truly random. So int switch case equals rand.next. So rand.next takes a minimum number and the most and the greatest number. In this case it's zero to two. So zero, one, two. So that's three numbers possibilities. Then switch, case switch. So we're switching on that random number. Case one, we write to the console case one. In case two, we write to the console case 2. And then default, which is 0. Console, write to the console, default case. And within each one, you notice that we have a break. Because in C sharp, it does not allow for something called a fall through. So we can't fall from one case to another. I also want to point out that default does not have to be in this list. I just chose to add it. Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, the bulk of what most people will have to do with programming, utilizing lists and arrays. Now, lists and arrays are collection types that are available within C Sharp. The list keywords comes from system.collections.generics, which means it derives from the system namespace. So, let's first look at an array, okay? So int, and then we see the open and close bracket. Count to five equals new int open close bracket with, I forget the name of the uh, bracket type for this one, but we have the number one comma two comma three comma four comma five, and then that closing bracket with the semicolon. And that's how you implement an array. And I should also note that you do not need to know any special namespace types to use an array. 
you could actually remove every single uh, namespace available in uh, the .NET framework and the array would still be accessible. Now, this can also be done with all of the primitive types. So that means you could do it with the boolean, you can do it with the int, string, char, or car, whatever you want to do to pronounce it. Uh, I can also be done with byte, bool, or I already said bool. So byte, uh, s byte, long, short, u short, u long. Oh, uh, there's a bunch of types and some of those were not primitive types. I was just listing off the types. Anyways, I was I was ranting. So let's go to list. List with the bracket int, which means it's a list of numbers. Count to five is a new list with the bracket consisting of the less than and greater than sign. And then we have uh, do, 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 what are those called again? Uh, oh, I uh, hold shift on the keyboard nine and zero. Then we have our brackets again: one, comma two, comma three, comma four, comma five. Close the bracket and terminate the line. <clears throat> Whew! I am losing my mind. Now, you may have noticed that uh, the list had something different than what we've seen before. In this case, uh, type parameters. So, the uh, less than and equal sign, less than or greater than signs together, let's say int or whatever inside of it, is something that we would call a parameter. In this case, it would be considered a type parameter. List can take a parameter of pretty much everything in C Sharp. But let's focus on the primitive types for now. Now, what if we want to print all the items in the array or list to the console window? How could we do that? I'll show you in both. I'll show you both with the for loop and for each loop. Let's start with the for loop. So we have our count to five list. For int i equals zero, i is less than count to five, and then if you put a period after it'll come up with the giant list of things that you could do with it in this case we want to count so we want the total number of what's in that list and then I plus plus right to the console count to five and then we have the array style with it with I so the reason I did this is to specify that I wanted the information from count to five, the list version anyways, and attach the array of numbers from the loops i integer and display the numbers appropriately. Now that sounds extremely complex, I know, but the simplest way I can explain it is we say, hey, here's the, here's the list that we have, and here's all my numbers. I want you to display them after I want you to display one of them after each loop. I hope that makes sense. It should. I'm good at explaining things. Now, I do want you to write the code that you see up here. Uh, the more you practice, the more you're going to understand and learn. Because you're going to build that muscle memory of typing. As well as see the results for yourself with your playing around. So let's do that list again with the count to five. Uh, with the count to five list, wow. Then do the for loop again. And this time just write console.write line i. You should notice that the results are 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and not 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. The reason is because the loop is just counting the number of elements in the list, not doing any counting and displaying the elements inside of the list. Also, whenever you're looping through something, and, well, regardless, whenever you have 
a list or an array or anything that derives from those, the index always starts at zero. Remember that. It is super imperative that you test this, remember it, write it down, put a sticky note on your forehead on it. It will bite you in the ass if you forget. Trust me. Now let's look at the for each version of this. And like I said, it's a much more simplified version than before. So we have that list of count to five again. And then we're going to type for each var num and count to five right to the console num. So like I said, this is a much more simplified version of the for each loop than I did before. And the results of the for each loop are the exact same as the initial for loop I presented before. I should note that if something does not utilize the I enumerable interface, the for each loop cannot be used. And we'll get into that a lot later. Uh, but for now, let's try to keep it simple. Or if you want and you're curious, you can always look up documentation on msdn.com. All right, here is my last slide. Uh, this is method types. Now, there are a myriad of different method types that are available, and I'll showcase a few of the most common. First and foremost, you have your returnable types, which means that it does something then returns the results to whatever you need it to be for. In this example, public int square, inside the parameters, we have int x, then return x times x. Notice it does not have any numbers or anything, so we don't know what x is. I'll show an example later that shows why this is the case and how come it works. Next we have public string high string x. Return high comma space plus x. So it's concatenating whatever x is going to be with high. And the last one, which is void. Now, void is special because it does not return anything. It's the only method type to do so. So, public void, hello world. Console dot right line, hello world. Now, I should note that all the primitive types can be a method type identifier, and void means it does not return anything, as I stated before. So, next. I'm going to do a code example in Visual Studio.